I've been just racking my brain to try to figure out how do I describe this Abrahamic aspect of fatherhood that can help correct the playful dad from thinking that's the end goal. And I think playful dads are important. Please play with your kids. That, that is not the best way to describe it. Um, there's something else. Hi, welcome to the Family Teams Podcast. Our goal here is to help your family become a multi-generational team on mission by providing you with biblically rooted concepts, tools, and rhythms. Your hosts are Jeremy Pryor and Jefferson Bethke, and we can't wait to chat about all things family. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Family Teams Podcast. I'm here with Kurt Storing from Vancouver, Canada. Kurt, how are you doing today? Doing well. Um, by the way, for those of you guys listening to this, uh, Kurt, is um, he does all the editing on the Family Teams Podcast. So if you're ever looking for a podcast producer, editor, Kurt's the best. What is it called? Proclaim <laughs> Podcasting? It is Proclaim Podcasting. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> Reach out to Kurt. I mean, I tell everybody, please do yourself a favor. So Kurt and I are going to talk about some things um, obviously we like to hit, kind of go back and forth between some fatherhood conversations some motherhood conversations. And, uh, so fatherhood conversation, um, our, our friend, uh, Tyler Graham, uh, he's a part of family Inc. Uh, Tyler's got an amazing, um, uh, content he puts on LinkedIn about fatherhood. Absolutely love the stuff Tyler puts out. Anyway, he, he shared this, uh, this video from Steve, Ir uh, is, is Steve Irwin, right? He's the, what was he called? The, um, you remember his crocodile hunter or something? Yes, yeah, the crocodile hunter. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, um, but really kind of pulled on our heartstrings with this uh this clip. I want to play this for uh Kurt and I to discuss, and then we're gonna hit one other topic. I want to talk a little bit about high agency fatherhood. So we're gonna tease that apart in a little bit. But first, um, Steve Irwin, I'll uh share this. Is there anything in this world that would want to make me give away what I'm doing now? Yes, yes there is, when my children can take the football that I call wildlife conservation and run it up. When they're ready to run up our mission, I will gladly step aside. And I guarantee you it'll be the proudest moment of my life. And my job will be done then and only then will I know that I have achieved my ultimate goal to be able to stand aside and let, let, let them run up my mission. <laughs> All right. So, man, there's a couple of things that I, I really find moving and uh, interesting about what Steve Irwin is saying here. Um, so I think on the moving side, he's, he's saying, look, when you have a really clear mission as a family team and somebody were to ask you, how do I pry this out of your fingers and cause you to, to say, no, I would be willing to give this up. Or, and it's really interesting. That, and this is why I think thinking about this from a multi-generational family perspective makes so much sense. And that is you're going to die anyway. And if you really care about your mission, what greater thing can you do than involve your children at the ground level as early as possible so that when you uh, pass on, they, they continue to, to carry the torch, you pass the baton on, and it's actually far better for your mission to hand it off properly to your children because your, you know, uh, your season's over. And of course, you know, Steve Irwin had that tragic death, you know, I think um, was killed by when he was, I think it was a, a stingray or something. Um, I remember that it's a number of years back, but it does, uh, I do think his son has continued in the, um, in, in the process of, of, carrying on the torch of the family mission, which is unbelievable to think about. So yeah, I want to maybe Kirk, get your reaction to that. And then also I'd love to, I know that this also serves, sort of stirs up another conversation I hear a lot about from families and that is, is it appropriate? You know, even when you have a family mission, that's this intense, is it appropriate to really raise your children in such a way that they, they feel the pressure? <laughs> what if they have their own dreams with their own family mission? So and that's a very legitimate question. I want to talk about that because I think it does get in the way. But first, I just want to like hang out for a minute around, um, you know, just you can see how moved he was by this possibility. Kurt, why do you think that is? Like, how, what does that start for you? I'm curious what, what you think of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said the second um, part of this because that was my question coming in, knowing that we want to talk about this. It's like, yes. And now having, you know, I've got four kids um, and it's like one of those ones are probably not going to want to take the football 
Right. And what that brings up for me, um, you know, maybe before I could just set the stage for the reaction, um, is that there's a very, I think there's a difference between an, an eternal and a temporal mission here. Um, and for someone like um, Steve Irwin, I think, is this Steve's first name? I think so. Uh, yeah. So, so Steve cool. Irwin, you know, he's got a very temporal oh, mission. Robert Pro Irwin? Is that, who, is that his, his, son. his son? Oh, nice. Yeah. Man, you know what? For all the 90s kids like me listening um, who, you know, can't even remember Steve Irwin's name, I, I apologize. Um, but <laughs> I think that, like, he was probably not a Christian. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Who am I to say? But um, I think there is probably a difference between our mission is to make disciples, is to make sure my kids love the Lord, is to make, you know, whatever that looks like in the kingdom. And separately, we do that through this temporal mission. And I think that part becomes a little bit more malleable for them to choose. And I've heard you talk about this before, their new um, family unit within the broader family unit when they get married. Um, but as long as that eternal mission, which is we love God, we serve God, bar none, that's sort of the thing that I think I relate to most in this. Um, and so maybe we can tease that out. But the specific, like the reaction that I get to this is I want to... I want to both love my mission and my kids as much as this guy did from just breaking down thinking about it. And, 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 you know, that's a, that's maybe more of a psychological emotional thing on my part. It's like, I feel like there's more I can do to just love what I'm doing and my kids enough to break down in an interview talking about it. Right. Um, so I don't know if anybody else needs to hear that, but I, I think I need to think on that a little bit more personally. Yeah. Yeah. It's what's really interesting. <clears throat> And this is, this is where, you know, I think individualism and, and sort of family uh, culture can, can kind of either collide or converge, depending on what happens in each individual family. But to have somebody like uh, this guy have such a clear family mission, I, I tend to believe that most of our children and most people listening to this do not have necessarily in their heart an assignment that's super narrow like, like this guy does, the St Steve Irwin. He, wildlife conservation he dedicated his life to this mission and he brought his children along um and i think that i think one of the things that people believe that makes this difficult is no everybody magically has their own um like uh, obsession and it relates to work and it it's their prime identity and one of the things that that seems to betray or not take into consideration properly is the fact that most people i think are generalists they have, they, they don't necessarily, they want to give their life to a specific mission, but they, if you ask them, like, what is, what is the, what is the driving, you have this, like this small, super specific world changing mission that you're obsessed with. Most people just don't have that. Um, but man, would they love to be a part of a team that has that? And would they love to work with a father that has that? And would they love to carry on a mission like that? And so I think that because that's where most people are coming from, what a gift to give to your children. If you are a father with one of these very specific missions to, to really articulate that and to lead your family into that while your children are still young enough to catch the, catch the vision. Um, and so I think, I think that's a very positive, beautiful thing. And I think when you hear him articulate that and see his son take that on, you can take a step back and say, wow, that's, that's imagine a world full of families like that, where we can actually conquer um, or deal with massive, massive issues that require multiple, multiple generations to, to actually um, achieve in any meaningful way. Um, and the reason you give that to a family is because families are multi-generational. And right now, the only, the only thing that is multi-generational are institutions like um, business entities. And um, if, if families are resetting every single generation, then you can only give meaningful multi-generational missions to NGOs or to a business entity or to a church or something like that. And this is something that I think I fundamentally am like trying to uh, push hard against within the Christian world, because we are told in Genesis 1 28 that the family is given a multi-generational mission. And if you don't think about family as a multi-generational entity, then you can't take on multi-generational missions. And this is, I think, been devastating to the church. The church um, has been stuck in a pattern of single generation families that cannot take on multi-generational assignments. And because of that, um, we are giving ourselves to, uh, institutions outside of the family because we actually see that they make 
more progress because they have the ability. You can at least imagine this church I planted. I remember I worked with a pastor, for example, once. And, um, you know, his kids, he raised his kids, you know, like normal Western dad, and they all were off doing their own things. But he was, you know, as a church planting pastor, obsessed with legacy and succession and paying off this building and handing off to the next generation as a, as a 501c3 institution, right, within our society, um, a nonprofit or a church entity. And the reason he, I think, was doing that was, was understandable because he had no hope that his family would function in this way and families in the West don't function this way. Right. So I think, yeah, I'm curious what your thoughts about that. Kirk, because I, it does feel like to me, it starts with trying to answer the question, are families, are families stewards of multi-generational missions or do only institutions get to steward multi-generational missions? Yeah. I've heard you talk about this in a couple of recent podcasts and it's so sad that we outsource this. Like we do all things parenting these days. Yes. And even if, because I'm, I'm just trying to run this back, like, do I expect me to have a mission this big? Sort of, because it's how I think. But do I expect everyone to have a mission like Steve Irwin has, like massive world changing? I don't think that's fair. But why can't we have levels to this where at least we're doing some form of um, building a generational idea? as a family, even if it's just locally, even if it's just a small thing. And, and that actually was important for me to hear from um, someone at church um, a couple of days ago, actually, who works in a multi-generational business. And he's the third generation. And I, it turns out that he's not entrepreneurial. And so when I was asking him all these questions, he's like, yeah, I just work there. And I'm actually really glad to just work there. I don't even want to own it necessarily. And it was like, oh, okay. But he's so grateful that his grandfather had the vision even if it was a local service, um, whatever kind of business it is. So I, I think if we talk about levels to this, yes, you can go ahead and have the Steve Irwin thing, but it's also fine to have something else where we're like, you know what? We are just the pie people in our neighborhood. We give pies to every new person who moves in here. And our neighborhood is better because we take responsibility for the hospitality of the neighborhood. Like that's a great vision because you're impacting all the lives. And I know in uh, you know, a little sneak peek of an episode coming up, uh, you guys talk about the quiet life. And that is so convicting for me personally, having laid down this last project I was doing, just not being on social media, being quiet. And the, the question I keep asking is, is this enough? Like, is this what's got, what God has got for me? And it's like, right now it is because I'm advancing my family in different areas than being the, the vocal noise piece out front. I'm sort of rallying the troops around a mission that's Honestly, I hope a little bit more centered on God, um, but it doesn't need to be look at all these big things. It's look at how we have our vision and mission that touches the people that we're interacting with every single day that has a deeper connection rather than a, uh, a shotgun approach to just hitting a thousand people, but only one time. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like taking it vertical instead yeah. of horizontal, which I think most people would default to thinking the vision has to be. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but like that's where that. I'm coming from. Have you ever considered starting a family business so you can spend more time working as a family team? We've started a year-long coaching program called Family Inc., where you get weekly coaching with Jeremy, access to our video training for launching family businesses, and lots of ideas for businesses to start that are working for other family teams. Head over to familyteams.com and click Family Inc. to learn more, or to set up a strategy call with Jeremy to see if this might be a good fit for you. Yeah, that's that that does stir up something for me because I just had this conversation with April a couple of hours ago. We were just talking about this and we were trying to decide whether or not to do this kind of big initiative that, you know, was going to bring a lot more people into our orbit and um and require a lot of work and I I was just praying about it this morning and I was like I just feel like the Lord say, "No, just disciple three more guys." And I talked to April and I was like, "Hey, um we already were recruiting people for this thing, um but what do you think about what if we just double down our family on just local discipleship?" I think um, and, and she really, that really resonated with her. And I said, you know, it, it is sort of counterintuitive, but it is very similar to the whole process of deciding to buckle down and have children. You know, you're, you're, you're having children and you're saying, I want to, um, really invest in these kids. And, and that, that is ultimately going to have such, so much of a greater impact, this quiet life of raising children, um, and making disciples. And, and so I, I, I think that I've, you know, likewise 
you know, to the process you've been through, Kurt, I, I've been really wrestling with this question of, you know, um, I, I really want to be careful to, to prioritize the small, the quiet, the things and the things that multiply. And that's why to me, I find it so helpful to understand this fruitful, multiply, fill, subdue, and rule that there's a process that our families go through and that you have to, it's, it is like the foundation of it is fruitfulness. And, um, and so there, there's this obsession, which is you, you're, you know, you're fruitful, you, you scale, you, you multiply, you scale, you fill, you scale. It's like, you always are trying to scale everything. You're trying to get more and more attention. Um, and I think that, I think that, and this, this is part of what I think, you know, I do, do think you have to be careful of in this context of this guy. Um, he, he, he'd had this world changing vision and it is really beautiful. And I want to celebrate, you know, the fact that this dad, Steve Irwin had, you know, to, to give her family a vision that big and that, that, um, amazing, it, it, it has, it, it is incredible. Um, but maybe it's more rare than, than common to, to have this giant world changing vision. And oftentimes I find that even the people that tend to have those, oftentimes there's something about their story that really, you know, God is giving them, you know, uh, this bigger vision. And in the meantime, you know, most of us are buckling down to like, how do we, how do we become fruitful? How do we raise children? How do we, how do we multiply? How do we raise children to have children and therefore, you know, get to the third generation in health and in strength? And then how do we make disciples? Um, you know, how do we have spiritual children who are fruitful, spiritual children who are multiplying? I mean, that so few families are even doing that basic stuff. Um, and so I think that kind of then addressing the second question we're trying to answer here, which is, is there a sense that a narrow family mission can, can subtly create disunity in a family team? Um, in other words, like, let's say Robert Ir Irwin is super excited about dad's mission, but you know, there's another son or another daughter or who, who they're not as called to that. And do they feel like a less a part of the family? Do they feel like less attached? Um, and I think that's the concern that a lot of uh, a lot of us in the West people that you know. And I think there's a legitimate conversation around how do we make sure that we're not creating a um, a culture in our family that really tilts the family culture towards certain children who feel like they really belong, and certain kids who feel like they belong less. That's a really easy thing to accidentally do. And the way that we try to combat that as a family is we basically say, look, guys, um, here's, here, here are some family missions that we feel called to. Like our family, there's three in particular that we're, we're very zeroed in on, you know, restoring the biblical bl blueprint of family, um, getting to a thousand disciple making households in Cincinnati and blessing um, Israel through unique assignments God's giving our family um, in the Middle East. Those are three things that constantly are coming up, constantly we're feeling called to, and we're engaging our kids in. Um, part of what I want to communicate to each of my children is that's just the beginning. Like that's what our generation feels called to. And if any of you guys want to pick up any of those batons, please join us. But man, if God gives you another mission, we're all going, we're all going to support you. And we're going to leverage the resources of the family um, to the same degree we, as we possibly can to maximize that God-given mission you're given. Now, while we have these unique missions, we're all, we're trying to inspire every single member of our family to be fruitful and multiply both physically and spiritually. And that actually comes first. Like to me, even before these kind of more unique uh, missions that our family feels called to or assignments, um, I'm not comfortable um, with any assignment that is going to somehow compromise our ability to be fruitful and multiply physically or spiritually. In other words, to either to have children and grandchildren and to have spiritual children and grandchildren to make disciples who make disciples. So that's how I kind of try to resolve the, the, the problem of having this powerful, you know, family mission that might, you know, subtly create some disunity. But yeah, how does, how do you think about that, Kurt? Does that, does that make sense? How would you maybe moderate that or any, any thoughts about how to, how to, how to handle that? Yeah, I think this is um, a very healthy tension for a father to intentionally consider. Um, I know even in setting the direction of family vision, family values, it's often the father who writes them down, who has the time, who's thinking about this. And it's, it's very easy to sort of railroad that through the family meetings and be like, you know, I already did this. Um, so this is what we're going to do. And 
in my situation, like my wife and kids needed me to do that. And I ended up bringing it to them and asking them what they thought, any questions, any suggestions, what else did I miss? And they all had feedback. And we generally agreed on, you know, five of the six and then added one and changed one, deleted one, whatever. But that's a tension that I'm holding between going like 80% on my vision and leaving room for them to come into it while also not being so rigid that it's like, Dad's setting the mission. Dad's being such a good dad because he's got all this energy on it. And the kids are like, I don't care about this at all. And so like, I need to have the force behind my leadership there without being a tyrant in a sense. And I wondered about this particular mission with Steve Irwin. Maybe the most important part of it was his mood. Like I, I would work with guys um, and I would tell them like a lot of our mood as a father is what leads the home. Like if I come into my house, even if I've had a bad day and I'm like, hey guys, Everyone's like, dad's excited. And I could be having a miserable time, but my mood is what gives everyone else the, yes. the right, as it were, to also match me. Yes. And so it could, maybe they don't want to be wildlife conservationists, but they're like, dad was excited about mission. Like, what's my thing to be excited about? And it's the mood behind the actual action itself that drives maybe what they are going to do. And so it's almost like, it's almost going back to that sort of eternal or, or higher level um, draw for them that it's going to be something, but it's because dad brought the energy initially, mm. even if it's small. And I think that's really important maybe for, for all dads to think about is like, what is that thing that you're going to do? But, but more important than that, bring the kids into the process right. and do all the family teams things, have the meetings, have the level 10 meetings with the spouse, have like all these things where they see why you're doing everything. And they see that you're doing them. Yes. Show them your, your tithing. Show them your giving. Show them when you're volunteering. And they'll see that it's a driving force of the family to pick a mission and then could, to go do that well for God's glory. Like That's maybe how I'm starting to see this. It doesn't matter what it is. It's that you're doing it and then how you're doing it. Yes. I love that. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's the thing that's... We, there's always sort of this assumption that you know every individual um, has sort of the same... You know, psychologists call it ego strength. So you, you're we're calling talking about is like dad energy. That is not true. People are different, and the person and this kind of dovetails into where we're headed in the next conversation. Dads do need to bring a certain kind of energy. I love what you said about mood in the house. There's a patriarchal vision that's so exciting and intoxicating to to wives and mothers, to children, to sons and daughters. Um, we need we need to be bringing that kind of energy around something, and it and maybe it's. Again, we, we're given a general mission by, by Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations. And, and so when our family sees our excitement and then rallies everyone around that, um, that is really exciting. And if, if your son or daughter or your wife comes to you with a vision, a mission that you're like, wow, that, that needs to be incorporated into our family, I still think it should be led with that dad energy, that patriarchal vision. You're, gonna, you're going to say, yes, guys, we are all getting around you know, our daughter or your mom's vision around this. This is so exciting. This is a part of our family's mission. But I do think the dad energy is absolutely, you know, priceless and critical component to that succeeding and capturing and exciting the hearts of the kids. It all starts, of course, with the dad having a personal uh, connection with each of each of his children and a deep connection with his wife so that when he brings that kind of energy, there is not that eye rolling frustration, that sense that, okay, this is really about dad. This is really dad's thing. He doesn't really care about us. Like, you know, that, that's where this gets toxic. There's a very toxic version of this. And I definitely want to call that out. But man, God designed it well. This is, there's a way in which this is so amazing. You can just sense the heart that Steve Irwin had in this clip for his children. It's that, that, that's the mood. You add that with the vision of the mission, like you were describing, Kurt. Man, that's the one two punch there that I think is going to get the family just rocking around a mission. All right. Um, yeah, that was a fun conversation. Need a blueprint to revise your family to be a multi-generational team on mission? The book Family Revision by Jeremy Pryor is the book that summarizes all the big picture ideas you hear on this podcast. Available on Amazon or familyteams.com. Now, I, I'm really excited to share this clip. We just have a few more minutes, but I want to get your take on this, Kurt, because um, I've been constantly been, been asked, what is the difference between the modern Western dad and the patriarch in the scriptures or in the Bible? Like the idea of a father, like how do you, you know, and so I've, I've constantly tried to contrast the playful father from like Bluey or other depictions that 
our culture is excited about and, you know, sort of Abraham. And so I saw this clip the other day and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I don't know if I've ever heard anyone articulate more clearly what I think is the difference. Um, and they weren't, they weren't trying to do this. They were, this is Chris Williamson and um, Eric Weinstein having a conversation about um, what they're calling um, high agency. And I was like, this is what I'm talking about. And it's really hard because there really aren't good words for this. And Eric Weinstein actually invented this phrase, um, I guess, um, several years ago, and it's been bandied around. And so they have a quick conversation about it. I'm going to play this clip and then just uh, uh, give you a couple thoughts and let Kurt get your reaction to this as well. So again, George uh, has this question he uses to work out who is the highest agency person in your entire life. Tell me. You're trapped in a South American prison. <laughs> you know, one yes, of this one is. It's absolutely, it's one of those awful 5,000 people in there. It's a hundred people per room. There's half the number of bunk beds. Everyone's got a skinhead. You have 24 hours to get out and you've got one phone call. Who'd you ring? It's hard in my case. Why? I happen to be the brother of Brett Weinstein. I happen to have worked for Peter Thiel. Um, uh, my wife is a total super mind. Uh, I've got no shortage of these people. You only get one phone call. I know. I can't figure out who most people. The thing that I worry about is that most people have no one. Yep. But you know, it has to do with people who are extremely generative and high trust and can readjust their thinking because no solution is clear. But yeah, I think a different version of that question is, is your problem which call to place or that you have no one you can even think of? I love this, this uh, framing. So <clears throat> I, I would say, you know, what Eric Weinstein is wrestling with there, do you have no one to call? And, and again, I, I see this as there, you have no father. Um, you, the, your father is designed to be the highest agency person in your life. And so part of what I want to, what I'm coaching fathers to do from the time they first start having children, or even before that, when they're young boys is we're trying to raise sons to be high agency men, because fathers need to be maximally high agency people because they're leading, they already have a team that they, and there, there, there's going to be an unlimited and unspecified number of complex problems that are going to be put on their shoulders. You know, hopefully it's not your kid calling you from a South American prison <laughs> saying, dad, I, I got to get out. I got 24 hours. I mean, but, but, but like what I feel like I, I try to accumulate in my life as a father is the, is every kind of capital to be able to address those kinds of problems. And I'm like, please call me. Like I will be on the plane and I'm going to bring uh, to bear the res every resource of this family to rescue you. Like, that that is fatherhood 101 like and i i am accumulating relational capital i'm accumulating spiritual capital i'm accumulating financial capital i'm accumulating intellectual capital so that i can properly lead my family and i can stay as high agency as possible not not for my benefit not because i'm trying to cultivate some kind of independent identity but because i know these problems are coming for my family and and somebody needs to be there to be able to help solve these problems. Um, and it's not that women, of course, can't also be high agency, but fathers must be high agency. Um, that, that's the difference. And, and so when I see depictions of, father, of low agency fatherhood, when I see the bluey dad and I'm like, that guy, he's a lot of fun, but my gosh, if you're in a South American prison, I'm not calling that guy. We're not gonna be, it's not pretend time anymore. Like I need a father in that moment. And these problems are coming. And so we have to be preparing men to be men, fathers to be fathers. And so that's that's the essence. And I'm like, I, it's been so hard to describe this properly. And so in these conversations, so when I heard this uh, this phrase, high agency, and then this awesome thought experiment in the South American prison, I'm like, if, if any father is listening to this, please make it your goal to be the guy that your children call. Um, that is what it means to be cultivating uh, fatherhood and on all the different things you're trying to do. And I know that when you're like 25 years old and you're, you're listening to this, you're like, I'm not high agency. I know, I know. Like your, your job is to get there. <laughs> You've got some decades in front of you. Like don't make decisions 
that are going to take away your agency, take away your ability to maximally make decisions that are in the best interest of your family. That, and so when I see guys giving away their agency um, in, in, a, in a way that is really going to be dangerous for their future family, that's the alarm bell that's going off in my head. And you see this with Abraham. Right after we introduced to Abraham, Lot is, is carried away in this, this terrible tragedy. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Abraham gets the 318 trained men in his household. And he literally goes out there and conquers you know, these five kings in order to bring back his nephew. Like it literally describes a very similar scenario to this thought experiment. And that's what I'm telling people. Like, look, read that chapter of the Bible. Avram, the exalted father, is this high agency guy. And when we're, we're given a depiction of what that actually looked like, when the scriptures try to give us the first depiction of that, this is what it shows us. This dad who's able to rescue really his adopted son from this terrible tragedy. And that's what we need to be prepared to do. Um, so anyway, yeah, I get really stirred up about this one. Because I'm finally like, oh, finally, somebody's describing <laughs> what is clearly, you know, the biblical father in a way that I can actually recognize and maybe share with other people. But yeah, Kurt, what are your thoughts about this one? Yeah, no, I, I like this a lot because this is one of the things I was struggling against as well. It's like there's something wrong with what we've been talking about with fatherhood. But like, what do you do? And, you know, you use Abraham a lot, which I think is the right way to do it. But it's also important that we bring this into the, you know, modern parlance in a sense, because so many people are so disconnected from history and from biblical, um, you know, just, just reading this. And so, you know, I, I can't add anything to that because I am still trying to become, um, you know, high agency. And he said generative, uh, he said high trust, and he said readjusting thinking because of uncertainty and unclearness. Um, I think that the last one there, I mean, the high trust is something that I think I'm okay at. Generative, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly how you describe that, but readjusting thinking and unclarity like this, this for me is like the linchpin almost to all of it because it's like you're responsible for everything all the time. Right. What your wife does and brings into the home, what your kids do and bring into the home, how they like what happens to them. It doesn't mean you're responsible such that if they do something wrong, like you should be thrown in jail and lashed and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, could you have stepped in earlier? And so as I'm thinking about this, like I can't add anything to what you said there because your experience. But for me, I'm going, how do I break this down into its constituent parts, which are one of these three buckets, but even more than that, what are the areas that I could be potentially giving away agency? And I think about this, like one very specific example um, is just an emotionality in a sense. A lot of guys are uncomfortable with anger or frustration or whatever. And this is just speaking personally why I even got into this space in the first place, because I suck so bad at it. And um, I was thinking about this, listening to uh, one of our other clients who had a podcast on, um, you know, pornography addiction and that kind of thing, and thinking about talking about um, what happens when your son brings this to you and says, "Hey, Dad, like I found these images and I've been watching and I can't stop." And for me, I was going like, "Well, my instinct is to be like, don't you know how bad this is? Here's the reasons you're going to stop right now, and if you just do what I tell you, we're good." And I thought, no, that's not how addiction works. What if I need to sit with him in that? What if it's going to take years and I see him being hurt by this thing that he can't get out of his life? Do I have the emotional bandwidth to sit in there with him rather than shaming him in a way that's going to make it worse? And then my influence over the rest of his life is gone because I can't, I'm not the high agency person that he'd call in that prison of addiction, for example. And so I was just blown away by the fact that it's not just that I can do a million burpees and I know a, you know, a bunch of guys who are like high net worth who can fly me there in a private jet. It's like, Hey dad, this really horrible thing happens. And right. if you don't get here with me emotionally, I'm never going to take anything to you again. Mm -hmm. And so that's just one example of like, there's probably 10 or 20 different categories yes. that I am going to need to think about in terms of where could I be giving up agency by not being intentional yes. and aware of how I show up as a father, especially in the places that are really uncomfortable. And then my ego doesn't want me to go to. So that might be a little bit, you know, in the weeds, but I think that, that for me is the biggest thing that I need to take away from this. Well, I think that's a really good point that, you know, are, is your son more likely to call you from a South American prison or after having just, you know, confessed to porn addiction? <laughs> it's like yeah. much, much, much more likely the second. Um, and yeah, are you cultivating the kind of agency, the kind of resources so that you can be a trusted, you know, generative thinker? to help your son, your daughter, your sons-in-law, your wife, your friends um, in those moments, your grandchildren someday. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good, very practical way to bring it down to, to reality. By the way, um, if you guys are looking for symbolic models for this, 
Um, so this, this, like the first 30 minutes of the Godfather, when I, his, his daughter's getting married and everyone is coming to him with their biggest problem. Um, I, I never quite knew what that was. I would sit there and watch the first 30 minutes of that movie. And I'd be like, what? It's just so weird. Like they're just coming to him in there. And, and his only request is that they call him Godfather. And I realize really what's, what he's saying is, and Godfather is, is sort of hit the symbolic way of saying uh, Uber father again, like that I, I am. I'm I'm acting like a uh, like like a like a like a meta father for my whole community, and so when they have some absolutely impossible problem, like they have you know a um, their daughter's boyfriend who is going to be deported, they they're looking for who's the highest agency person in our entire network that could actually stop this deportation from happening. Is anybody that has political capital that could actually spend it on behalf of my family? Um, I got to find not just a father, but like the top father in my network. But I just think that's a really good example of, again, you, you, you're, you're building up these uh, things in tiny microcosm um, in your, the early stage of your fatherhood. And as, as you get getting more and more intense, you just, you, you're becoming that increasing high energy or high agency person. So um, yeah, I just love that de de depiction. Um, and I think that it gives us at least something to uh, like a, if you don't have a phrase for something, it's almost impossible to think about it. Like that's just the way the human brain works. And so I've been just racking my brain to try to figure out how do I describe this Abrahamic aspect of fatherhood that can help correct the playful dad from thinking that's the end goal. And I think playful dads are important. Please play with your kids. That, that is not the best way to describe it. Um, there's something else. And I think high agency is really the thing that um, I think I was like searching for. And so you'll probably hear that come out of my mouth a lot <laughs> going forward. Um, but I wanted to anchor that um, concept in this podcast so you guys can hear that. So awesome. It's well, not quite as good as the anti Bluey dad. I really like that. I'm throwing my money. <laughs> you want to go that for that one? one? I, just, I just love hearing you uh, harass Bluey. So uh, <laughs> if you can throw that in there, I'd be happy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep that going. We'll, we'll keep giving Bluey a hard time. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much, Kurt, for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Family Teams podcast. If you're enjoying this content or have learned something new, please make sure to leave a rating and review and share with a friend. To stay up to date with our events, new content, and products, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Family Teams.